Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, start off the adult uh, Sunday school lesson. Um, today is November 27th, 2022. Thank you for being with us this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, good morning. We ask that you be with us and help us as we um, look in your word today and let it speak to us and let us learn from it and obey it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good morning. We're in 1 Kings chapter 21. There's only 29 verses in the entire chapter, so we'll get through here relatively quickly. But there's a lot of good information in here. And uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Je uh, Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel. Uh, near the place of Ahab, king of Syria, Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near my house, and I will give thee a better vineyard for it. Or if it seems good for thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. In other words, he goes up to the sky, the king goes up to the sky and says, I'd like your vineyard. Uh, I'll either trade you for one of mine, or I'll buy it from you. Um, side note, uh, now this is not the uh, official position of Beulah Baptist Church, this is just a uh, personal observation by me, but today we would have, what, eminent domain? Is that what it's called? Where a uh, municipality will say, we need this property, and they go ahead and take it. So anyway, this is the first recorded um, instance of eminent domain in, uh, in the Bible. And Naboth said to Ahab, said to the king, The Lord forbid it uh, that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers unto you. In other words, it had been in his family for all those years. And you know what it's like to have a farm, ranch, whatever, um, that's passed down through generations to the family. And Ahab came into his house uh, heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth did Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. In other words, he's having a pity party. He's uh, depressed. He's upset. He decides not to eat. Have you ever been in a time where you've been so angry or sad where you don't eat? Obviously, I've never, obviously I've never had that situation. But... <laughs> Uh, Jezebel, his wife, now here's Jezebel. Now, if you notice, you don't hardly find any girls named Jezebel anymore. <laughs> There's a reason for that. Okay, so Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, why is, why is your spirit so sad that you don't eat any bread? And he said to her, because I spoke unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, give me my vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Uh, I'm trying to um, whine there. That's what, <laughs> what it was there. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, don't you govern the kingdom of Israel? In other words, aren't you the king? And arise, eat bread, let thy heart be merry, and I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed him with a seal and sent the letters unto the elders, to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. In other words, we're going to, sell, we're going to have a celebration. We're going to have a party and Naboth is going to be the honored guest. We're going to have a party honoring Naboth. And set two men, sons of Belial, uh, before him, or worthless men before him, uh, to bear witness against him and say, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Ooh, that's not a party I'd want to be the honor guest at. So this is the king. This is the king's wife, what Jezebel, the queen, comes up with to get her husband the, uh, the vineyard he wanted. And the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in the city, did as Jezebel had sent them, and it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. Okay, so she actually sent these letters in the king's name, saying, um, 
you know, set up this, this party, this great celebration from Naboth, and then have two worthless people during the party say that Naboth had blasphemed God and the king and go out and kill him. And it says the men in the city, even the elders and the nobles who were in the inhabitants in the city, did as she had sent unto them. So, you know, she's following the uh, orders of the king, allegedly, because it was sealed with a seal. Now, you know, an excuse would be I was only doing what I was ordered. And that didn't work at the Nuremberg trials, if you've uh, ever read history, you know, saying I'm just obeying orders. But don't you think they would have thought, hmm, why do we want to do this? You know, now, why did they have to have two men bear witness before him? Good answer, good answer. Yes, under Jewish law, you had to have two witnesses. Um, Deuteronomy 17.6 and Deuteronomy 19.15, and it's there in your uh, handout. Did everyone get a handout? Okay. Um, Michael or Casey, I think Ken needs one. He just came in. Um, so you had to have a, you could not put someone to death on the witness of one person. You had to have at least two or three witnesses for a capital crime. So that's, um, uh, that's why you had to have two witnesses. So, uh, good answer, uh, good answer, um, Morgan. Okay. So, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Then came in two men, uh, children of Belial, or worthless people, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. And they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. So, they went ahead and did that. You know, it, it's a shame people are perverted enough to do false witness against people, especially in a capital. That would be what, what's the law, uh, the offense called perjury, right? When you commit false witness. Oh, isn't that one of the Ten Commandments? You will not false witness against your neighbor? Wow. And also you shall not commit murder? So two offenses right there. And they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. Now, stoned being stoned with stones, not pharmaceuticals. But he was stoned to death and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, uh, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass... When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he is gone down to possess it. And you shall speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and taken possession? And thou shalt speak to him, saying, thou, Thus saith the Lord, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your blood, even yours. So here, now why would God judge Ahab? Because he didn't have anything to do with that plot. Okay. Uh, it was the letters were signed in his name. He should have known what his wife was doing. Well, remember what. Verse 7, and Jezebel said, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. You know, and he didn't say, well, you know, I tried and he won't give it to me, but he let her do it. He may not have been there when she did the seal, you know, put the seals on or wrote the letters, but he had to know somehow that his wife was up to no good. You know, is it just a coincidence that the guy that had the vineyard is now dead? You know, shouldn't that go through huh, I just talked to him last week and he was taken out and stoned and he's dead. Now I can get the, hmm, amazing how that worked out. I mean, should it not have something, you know, and it said he went ahead and took possession. You know, he didn't say, oh, this is not right. You know, this should not have happened. 
I had nothing to do with it. But he eagerly went down to take possession. And what's that old expression? Possession is what? Nine-tenths of the law? You know, in other words, he, he may not have been uh, the one that wrote the letters or put the seal on them, but he eagerly uh, bore the fruits or, you know, was, was eager to get the vineyard. So, <clears throat> now, where it says in verse 19, uh, the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick your blood, even yours. That's actually fulfilled in 1 Kings uh, 22. Oh, spoiler alert. Next week, you'll learn about that. And also in uh, 2 Kings 9.26. So, uh, spoiler alert for next week. But that's going to come to fruition. Okay, and Ahab said to Elijah, you, why have you found me, O enemy of mine? And Elijah answered, I have found thee because thou sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, now, have you ever had somebody upset because you want to tell them about the gospel? The gospel, you know, if you look in your Bible, you know, the, the first four books of the, the uh, New Testament, the gospels, you know, it says the gospel according to St. Matthew, according to St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John. Gospel means good news. That's what the word gospel means. And we do have good news. But in today's society, you have people that don't want to hear the good news. You know, notice that Ahab thought that Elijah was his enemy. You know, in today's society, when you try and tell people about Christ, you know, they'll want to talk about everything but that, or that's offensive. And, you know, what's so ironic is we have good news. You know, now I'm going to tie this into the New Testament here. Uh, Romans 6, 23, uh, for all have sinned come, uh, no, that's Romans 3, 23, all have sinned come uh, short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 is uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that good news? You know, that's good news. Thank you. In Acts 7, 54 and 60, in Acts 7, talks about the st uh, stoning of Stephen. And when Stephen, in Acts 7, he's relaying the whole history of the Jewish people to the um, uh, Jewish council. And he goes, and then he talks about Jesus and being crucified. And it says in Acts 7 that the, the uh, rulers put their fingers in their ears and rushed him and killed him because they were offended of his message. Oh, speaking of Acts, uh, open invitation, come to the uh, Wednesday night uh, Bible study at 6. We're in the book of Acts, and it's a good Bible study, so come on out. That's a little uh, public service announcement during the uh, Sunday school lesson. Uh, Luke 21, turn over to Luke 21, verses 12 to 19. The reason I'm doing this is because sometimes people look at, uh, you know, what's going on in the Old Testament and say, how does that affect me? Or why are we, you know, there's one uh, radio minister, uh, Lon Solomon, um, up around D.C., and he's got a program. And at the end, you know, have a sermon at the end, he'll say, so what? And then he'll tie it all into everything that goes, you know, how it applies to people's lives. But in uh, Luke 21, 12 to 19, uh, whoops, wrong chapter. Give me a second here. Oh, 21. Here we go. But before these, all these things, you know, and this is, Jesus was asked about, you know, what are the ends of the sign, uh, the signs of the end of the world, the signs of the end of the age? And uh, you'll hear of wars, commotions of wars, pestilences, uh, famine, earthquakes, um, great fearful sights, great signs. But before all these things, they shall lay your hands on you and persecute you, deli delivering up to the synagogues, into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for na namesake. And it shall turn to you a testimony. Uh, therefore, settle it in your hearts. Do not meditate before what you shall answer. I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which your adversary shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you will be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you they shall cause to put to death. And you will be hated of all men for my name's sake. You know, so 
Jesus warned the uh, disciples there would be opposition to the gospel. There would be opposition to the good news. That's what gospel means. Uh, Luke 10, 1 to 12. Go back a couple pages, back to the right. No, to the left. That's the other way. Yeah. Right of the snow. Okay. Okay. Luke 10, 1 to 2. Um, and the Lord appointed 70, sent them out two by two before his face. Uh, and he said to him, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest should send forth laborers into his um, harvest. And later, uh, Jesus talks about when you tell the good news, you know, rejoice when they accept it. And if they don't accept it, then when you leave that city, shake the dust off your feet and go on to another place. You know, so... That's our mission. You know, we're all evangelists. We're all to talk about the good news. Remember when the disciples were brought before um, the, the uh, Sanhedrin and everything, and they were uh, threatened with beatings and death, and they said, w but we cannot speak about the things we've seen and heard. You know, they had to talk about what they had seen and heard. Okay. And then the last one is 1 John 1.9. I think you all know that. That's a good memory verse. Actually, let me start with verse 5. 1 John, uh, 1 John 1, 5. Then this is the message which we have heard and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ the Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's sort of like a summary of the New Testament right there. You know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, that's the good news. Unfortunately, sometimes in today's society, when you try and tell someone the good news, the gospel, you're accused of being hateful or bigoted or whatever. But we still have an obligation to tell them. But you notice, even back here in the Old Testament, you know, someone speaking for God was considered an enemy. So it's nothing new. So I'm just tying this into modern times. Okay, so back to First Kings. Okay, um, let's see, verse 21. And I will bring evil upon thee, take away thy prosperity, and will cut off from Ahab him that uh, pisses against the wall and him that shut up and left in Israel. And I will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, like the son of Basha, the son of uh, Elijah, for the provoc provocation wherein thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And the reason for all this is, if you go back to, uh, let's see. Um, I'm sorry, it's in here. I had just seen it. Um, Ahab is considered the most evil of all kings in Israel. And that's why the, um, that's why the um, uh, judgment against him, because of what he had done. And he was considered the most evil of all kings in Israel. Imagine having that as your uh, epithet. You know, this is the most evil of all kings. Or in a, uh, you know, in a uh, memory, you know, a uh, his history, you know, this is the most evil of all kings. So, okay. Anyway, so this is why this is against uh, Ahab. Okay. So... Uh, verse 22, and of Jezebel also spoke the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Je Jezreel. And that's in 2 Kings 9.10. That comes to fruition. So in other words, he's saying, Your wife, the queen, she's going to be eaten by dogs. Um, and him that dies of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. 
And he that dies in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. In other words, if someone dies, either the vultures, the buzzards are going to eat him, or if he's in the uh, city, the dogs are going to eat him. Now, when they say dogs, they don't think of little, you know, we, we sometimes get attached to little canines and they're cute little things and everything, but they're there talking about the ferocious wolves, you know, that type of thing. So, not little, little puppy dogs. Here it is, verse 25. But there was none like Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. So in other words, his wife was complicit. I mean, again, she sent the, the letters in the king's name and all that. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all the things as did the Amorites, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now, let me pause here. A lot of times people say, you know, how could God order all the, you know, the Israelites to wipe out the Amorites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perivites and all those? You know, why would God order that to be done when the Israelites went into the land? Well, back in the Old Testament, God said, because they would cause you to turn away from God. And you would start, the Israelites would start following their practices and uh, the idolatry and worshiping their gods. And also, it would corrupt the line from Abram, Isaac, and Jacob for the Messiah to come through. So that was one of the things. It would uh, turn the people away from being the chosen people. Okay, uh, verse 27, and it came to pass when Ahab heard these words that he rent his clothes. Okay, that means he tore him. He didn't go to men's warehouse and rent a suit for the weekend. He, when they say rent, his, it means he tore. And that was a sign of humility, you know, when people would rent their, when they would tear their clothes. Especially when you consider back then, they could not just go down to, you know, um, uh, Walmart or... Um, Sears or you know some other place um, and get clothes off the rack you know um, they would have to make them it was expensive to make clothes you know because you had to sew them by hand they didn't have sewing machines with computers and in them and everything else you had to sew them by hand they were expensive and if you rent your clothes or tore them it was a sign of of uh, humility was a sign of uh, grief sometimes people would do that when they were grieving mourning they would tear their clothes and all that so anyway he rent his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh sackcloth is basically like a burlap bag imagine wearing a burlap bag that would be real itchy and scratchy and not comfortable and he fasted and laid in sackcloth and and uh, walked around dejectedly and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, You see how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon the house. So here's the most wicked king in Israel. He hears that God's going to uh, judge him and wipe him out and his family and his wife, and he's actually sorry over what he's done. And you notice what God did. He said, I'm going to bring judgment, but I'm not going to bring it on Ahab. I'm going to bring it on his uh, descendants. And why, why do you think his descendants would be included? Well, in the history of the Bible, you see that happening a lot. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, the old, like, father, like, son, you know, type thing. Um, God's merciful, you know, and, you know, God is so good to us. You know, and, and there's times when God loves us even when we don't love ourselves. And God loves us and can forgive us, and he's merciful, you know, even to the, to the wicked. Remember what it says in the New Testament, you know, God calls, causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. You know, even the unjust get rain, you know, and get, you know, sometimes they look like they're blessed and all that. Turn over to Exodus 34. Exodus chapter 34. 
verses 6 and 7. Okay. Let me start in verse 5. Okay. Let me start in verse 1. Exodus 34. So you had the context. Okay. And the Lord said unto Moses, uh, Hew two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which you broke. And be ready in the morning. Come up to the mount, morning unto Mount Sinai, and present yourself there at the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout the mount, neither let the flocks or herds feed before the mount. And he hewed two ta- tables of stone like the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning, went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So a lot of times people say, well, what's the Lord's name? What, you know, what shall we call the Lord? You know, there's some people say, we need to call him Lord. We need to call him God. We need to call him Jehovah. You know, and in the Old Testament, there's a lot of... uh, Uh, different names for God based on God's nature. You have Jehovah Jireh, the one that provides, um, Jehovah Nissi, the God of peace. You have all these different uh, names for God's nature and all that. And, you know, there's ones that say it's uh, Yahweh. Um, You know, there's all different names people say for God. But what does God say his name is? Well, yes, he said, I am, you know, the... uh, uh, the ever I am, you know, but also uh, here, and the Lord passed by him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and will no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and to the children, till the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. So there, God said, this is my nature. You know, I am merciful. I am long-suffering. In other words, I'm patient, uh, abundant in goodness and truth. And think about how patient God is with us. You know, and also think about, you know, uh, Emmanuel, God with us. You know, how God being with us, you know, God is with us. Think of all the various, you know, attributes or nature, the nature of God. And God says, I'm merciful and gracious. And we're not worthy of his mercy or his grace. And God's so patient. You know, remember when when Peter said to Jesus, you know, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? You know, is it seven, uh, seven times? And, you know, because back then it was a tradition that you were only obligated to forgive somebody twice. You know, after that, you didn't have to. And the thing is that, you know, Peter is being uh, really, you know, gracious. How, how about I forgive someone seven times? And Jesus said what? Seventy times seven. And that's not literally 490. You know, imagine if God had a limit of 490 times he would forgive us. You know, I would have run out a long time ago. But God is gracious and merciful. And isn't that great? He's patient. And that's good news. Again, good, isn't this good news? This is good news. This should be exciting. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31. Turn over to Deuteronomy. That's after Numbers. Chapter 4, 31. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, 31. It's there in your notes. Um. You know, and here, Moses is telling the people about uh, warning against idols in in this chapter. And he says, um, verse 27, you know, um, if you go unto idols, the Lord will scatter you among the nations, be left you in number among the heathen, where the Lord shall lead you. And there you will serve the gods, the works of man's man's hands, wood and stone, which do, do not see, neither hear, nor eat, nor smell. But from there, you shall seek the Lord your God. You will find him if you seek with him with all your heart and all your soul. And when you're in tribulation, all these things are come upon you. Even in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient unto his voice. Here it is, verse 31. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of his fathers that he swore unto them. And... 
Uh, oh, verse 32. Now ask of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth. Ooh, God created man. Isn't it amazing? Today's society, man likes to create God. You know, but anyway, there's, again, you know, not just Genesis, but there in Deuteronomy, it talks about God created man. Okay. Um, Second Chronicles 30, verse 9. And Second Chronicles, that's after First Chronicles. So Second Chronicles 30, chapter, uh, chapter 30, verse 9. I'm just try trying to tie all this together about God and his nature. For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive, so they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So God was saying that even, you know, if you turn away from me and you find your way back, I will be merciful. And the last one is Joel, or Joel, uh, verse 2, 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. Okay, let me start with 12. Therefore now also, uh, says the Lord, Turn ye to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. In other words, tear your heart, not your clothes. But turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repents of the evil. So, isn't that great where God is merciful and God is loving and he's patient with us? And isn't that great? You know, we serve a God that is, that is great. You know, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. You know, when you think of all that, how the mercies of God, how merciful God is to each of us. You know, and how he forgives us. And that should be good news. That should be reassuring this morning as we close on uh, first, uh, first Kings chapter 19. I'm sorry, 21. First Kings chapter 21. So here you can see how God's nature does not change. You know, customs and, um, you know, the way people look at things change. But God's nature does not change. He is always merciful to us. If we call out to him, like it says in 1 John, you know, um, we're, let me turn to it so I read it correctly. Ah, I don't want to misquote it. If we, 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. That should be something. Uh, that should give us uh, encouragement today, right? So, trying to tie this all in together. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, good morning. We thank you for the word in the Old Testament and the New Testament fulfillment and how you are a, you're a wonderful God. You are gracious, you're patient, you're loving, you're compassionate, you're merciful. And you're just. And we thank you for all those attributes of you. We ask that uh, you be with us. And if there's anyone out there that needs to confess their sins, we ask that you give them the conviction and let them turn to you. And, Lord, we ask that uh, you be with us and help us. Thank you for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.